Hey everyone, it's Shanna, 5M family. That's what we are now. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you've been with the channel for a while, long time no see. So today, let's talk sourdough. Um, I'm going to start off by saying to you that I am very new to sourdough. Um, I just really started baking sourdough in December, so I don't have all the answers. However, I have gathered enough data over the last three months to feel confident in making this video and hopefully helping some of you uh, newbies that are wanting to get started in sourdough. So the first part of this video is going to be about me rambling and talking, kind of being on a soapbox, so to say. Um, so if you don't want to hear this part of it, I, as soon as I edit this video, I'll tell you what part you can jump to to show you when me making the bread. But if you are a beginner, I encourage you to listen to this part because I do think it's somewhat important and hopefully gives you enough... Um, what's the word, confidence to bake your first loaf. So when, back in September, I was over at a neighbor's house and she was cooking sourdough. And I said to her, oh my gosh, I wanna, I wanna do that. And, but I was so scared because I'd seen all the videos and all the terminology and all the things. And I was like, there's no way I can do it. There's just too many steps involved. But I said, I wanna start. She had a very healthy, active starter and so I asked her for some. She gave me probably less than a tablespoon. And she gave it to me in a glass jar with a lid on the top of it and said, here. I thought, yeah, right, I'm not doing this. And promptly put it in my refrigerator. So that was September. And then um, every time I opened the refrigerator, I saw it. And I would want to bake with it, but I just, again, didn't have the courage to be able to do it. Because in the sourdough world right now, everything is big, bad, and scary when it comes to sourdough. So I put it in the refrigerator, and around December, we were out for Christmas break. Um, we had a lull in, like, just life. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to get that starter out, and I'm going to feed it. And um, I had messaged... Um, some friends and I was just like hey I need some help like what do I do first I knew I needed to feed the starter I don't even know what that mean meant like I had no idea what do you do? what does that mean like how to feed it anything like that so I literally just winged it I had this tablespoon of starter and in my brain back from you know middle school high school I thought to myself I'm just gonna feed it proper amounts I didn't know what I was doing like equal amounts, I'm sorry, equal amounts. So there's like a tablespoon of starter in there. So let me do a tablespoon of um, flour, a tablespoon of water. And it grew. And I was like, okay, I'm doing something right. So at that point in my brain, I was like, okay, now I have like two tablespoons of starter. Let me do two tablespoons of water and two tablespoons of flour. And it grew again. And... So I did that over the next couple days to the point where I had so much starter <laughs> because I just kept feeding it. And um, it was exciting. I was really, really excited on how, what to do. But then I just kind of got stuck because then I didn't know what to do at that point. And I researched recipes and I landed on, I landed on this one recipe that was super easy and it was measured everything in uh, by volume not by weight so like cups teaspoons things like that which if you hear in the sourdough world that's a big no-no but i have found a f i've in this journey figured out that what works for me may not work for you and what works for you may not work for me and that's okay because it's sourdough people <laughs> it's not that important it really is not so if you get on those sourdough pages for the very not like very seasoned and senior level sourdough bakers they're going to tell you no you need to measure by um weight and get a kitchen skill so anyways fast forward to that my first loaf i had nothing fancy i didn't because i didn't know what i was doing i didn't know what i needed to have i think i baked with um a bowl that I had, it wasn't metal. I knew you can't use metal, but I used a glass bowl, um, a Pyrex glass bowl. Um, I used a, what did I use my hands to mix it with? Cause I didn't have a dough whisk or um, 
one of these things. Um, I didn't have a banneton, so I just used a towel. And I didn't have a score, so I just used a knife. That was it. And I baked my first loaf. It was amazing. It turned out amazing. And I didn't use anything by the rule books. But then where I went wrong was, then I started doing so much research and confusing myself and changing everything. And then I started measuring by volume and then that got confusing for me. Um, no, wait, I'm sorry. I started measuring in weights. I got a kitchen food scale measuring in weights and I just was not getting the same type of outcome as I did when I was measuring in volume. And that is okay, people. It is okay. So, over the last month or so, I have gone back to the tried and true recipe and I have learned some things along the way. And it works for me. So all that to say this, guys, don't sweat it. Honestly, do not sweat it. If you go on those Facebook groups or, or TikTok and question and they, they start giving you answers, um, there are people out there that genuinely know what the heck they're doing when it comes to sourdough. I don't know a lot, but in, in reality, I'm not selling my loaves. I'm feeding my family. I'm gifting them to my parents. I am making them for neighbors, like, and they don't care. They don't care how big the ear is or what the oven spring looks like or any of that stuff. It is made with my own hands and from my kitchen and my love of sourdough, baking sourdough, and that's all that matters. It's not that serious. And I think that's what I wish somebody had told me in the very beginning. Um, so I'm gonna show you what I do. And again, this may not work for you and that's okay. I encourage you just to experiment. Are you going to fail? Yes. I have I've had loaves that come out. My first loaf was fantastic. That's when I started switching things up because I thought I had to do things different to become like a sourdough baker, like having that title or whatever. Um, and I've learned that that doesn't have to be the case. Um, I can do what works for me. And if my bread turns out yummy, what does it matter? Honestly, what does it matter? So I've had bread loaves come out perfect. I've had bread loaves that come out gummy. I've had some that I've overcooked and I just keep going. They all taste great. So. Anyways, that's my soapbox. So if you're here now because you didn't have to want to listen to my soapbox, here I am. And I'm going to introduce you to all the stuff that I use. Remember my first time I did not have all this stuff. It took me months to kind of like, well not months, a month or two to kind of get all of this. So use what you have at home. Okay, so like I said in the beginning about my starter, I just kept feeding, feeding, feeding. I had all this. And I'll be honest with you, somebody's gonna say, why do you need that much starter? I don't, I don't need this much starter. Um, but I'm about to bake, so, and what I do with my starter, and this is me, I don't discard. Um, to be honest with you, the discarding confuses me, and I didn't wanna have to put that much thought into it, so I don't do that. Um, Susan comes out like once a week when I'm ready to bake her, bake with her, and I feed her, I give her a really good feed, and let her rise and then I bake with her. And then she goes in my refrigerator until I'm ready to use her again and then I pull her back out. It's that simple, that's what works for me. So probably once I bake with her and take out what I need, I usually have like a cup left over that goes back in the refrigerator. And then when I'm ready to use her again, I take her out and I feed her. So I fed her this morning um, because I knew I wanted to do this video. So she's more than doubled, which that's what you're going to want to look for in your starter. Um, you do need to make sure it doubles to be able to cook with it, only because that just means it's really active and it's strong when it doubles. In the cooler months, it's going to take a while to, to double. They need warmer temperatures. So now it's warmer outside. I think we're going to be in like the 70s today. She doubled very, very fast this morning. Um, in the winter, it sometimes would take hours, um, sometimes overnight for her to double um, on the counter, but whatever, you just gotta find your timing. That's all it's about. So, oh, okay, all of that to say this, we're gonna make some bread today. Easy peasy, guys. Nowhere, 
around here do you see a kitchen scale? I don't have a kitchen scale. I mean, I don't have one out. I do have one, but I don't use one. Um, this is going to be measured by volume. It's not going to be measured by um, weight. This is my recipe, so you don't have to follow it if you don't want to. Um, what do I have? I have my starter, pink Himalayan salt. I have found a difference in the salt. I don't know what. I can't tell you specifically what the difference is, but I have noticed when I moved over to pink salt that this is going to work. So fine salt, pink Himalayan salt. Again, this is spring water, 99 cents for a gallon. And then I'm going to use my King Arthur bread flour. Now, I do remember the first time I, I did this, I used all-purpose flour. And that's all I had because I didn't know you had to use bread flour. And it turned out fine. Um, but when I use bread flour, I do get a better texture to the bread. Um, it just seems to work better. So is everyone's like, is the off-brand uh, bread flour fine? Yes, use it. Who cares? Just make sure it's unbleached. Um, Walmart bread flour works fine. Um, I just like King Arthur. I just, I just do. Um, but if you're at the store at Kroger or Walmart or wherever and you find the off brand of bread flour, buy it. Just use it. It doesn't matter. Um, I do have a dough whisk and I bought this very early on. Um, but you don't have to use it. Whatever. My big measuring cup and this to scoop out my starter and actually I'm going to change because I don't want to put metal inside there in her one because if I hit that glass just right because she's in a glass jar I could break her and I'm not going to do that so I'll just get my handy dandy little plastic one out all right let's make some bread so my recipe is one cup of starter one and a quarter cup of water warm water I'm going to put it in the microwave for about 15, 20 seconds. I'm not gonna do it more than that. You don't want it hot because you don't want it to kill the starter. These are the two that you're gonna mix first. You're gonna mix your starter and your water. So let me get the water warmed up and then I'll show you what we do from here. All right, so I ended up warming it for like, I don't know, 30 seconds or whatever. Yes, I just stuck my finger in it. My hands are clean and this is my house. So um, you're gonna pour your water in here. I do wanna, let you know I didn't have a glass bowl the first time I ever made bread um, I did get one just because during the proofing or bulk fermenting stage it's nice to have the glass bowl because I'll show you what you need to be looking for um, we'll go over all of that so um, one and a quarter cup of warm water and then we're gonna get a cup of the starter out and I just dip her in dip it in and I just give it, look at her. Ooh, she's pretty. See? And then I'm going to get that and I'm gonna dump it in here. And guys, a starter is very, 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 very sticky. Very. And it's like concrete. Do not pour straight starter or discard down your plumbing pipes. Don't do it. It can cause all kinds of problems. So I'm gonna scrape all this off. Just kind of work it off because it's sticky. Now, so you've probably heard people do the float test. I don't even really know what that means, guys. You're supposed to see if your starter is ready by the float test, but I have also read it's very inaccurate. The float test just shows that you have enough gas in your starter to um, make it rise. So I've never used the float test. <laughs> Some of this is floating, so I guess that's good. All right. So we've got one cup of starter, one hefty just cup of starter in here. And get this off. Now, I will say this. Look at her. See her now? Look at that. Oh my gosh, she's so pretty. I get so excited. Look how pretty she is. 
Now, the cool thing about it is I'm going to put her back on the counter and she's going to rise again. Like, I just kind of burped her a little bit, you could say. But if I put her back on the counter, she's going to rise again. All right, so here we go. All right, we're going to give this a good stir. You're going to want a milky solution, or solution, not a solution, milky mixture. And she is smelling really sourdoughy. <laughs> All right. You may have a little bit on the bottom like this. See how it's kind of stuck on there? Okay, it's not gonna hurt anything. All right. So now we've got the milky solution and we're gonna do three, three cups of bread flour. I put my like measuring cup in here and then I just kind of sift it down. I don't want it packed but I just kind of want to break it up. So one, two, three. Next thing is gonna be your salt, one teaspoon of salt. One teaspoon of salt. Now, some people add this 30 minutes after the dough, the water and the starter and the dough is mixed, then they add the salt 30 minutes later. Um, I've done that before. Again, I don't see much of a difference in it, so I just go about my business. So I'm gonna take my dough whisk and you're gonna give it a stir. And this is gonna thicken and it's gonna be really difficult if, to mix. And if you need to use your hands, Use your hands. Some people in, like to feel what the dough feels like and how it's coming together, they prefer to use their hands. So you just kind of keep working it in until you get what they, what you've heard it lovingly called as a shaggy dough. And what that means is it's going to be the dough is all incorporated. It's not going to be watery. It's not going to be, it's not going to be super, super like floury. It's just going to kind of be pasty. Pasty. That's my new word for this. Pasty. All right, that looks nice and together. So now, what we're gonna do, show you guys what it looks like. This is what it looks like, okay? Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna cover this and let it sit on the counter for 30 minutes and then this is when we start our stretch and folds at 30 minutes. Shower cap, bought them on Amazon. You can use a dry, or um, a damp paper, or a damp kitchen towel tea towel, whatever. These seem to be the easiest. I bought them on Amazon, like a hundred pack or something like that for like $5. You're gonna put the shower cap on, just like this. You're gonna leave it on the counter for 30 minutes and we're gonna do stretch and folds. And we'll talk about that when I come back. Okay, it's been 30 minutes. It's been sitting on the counter and we're gonna do what is called stretch and folds. You've probably also hold it called, heard it called coil folds. Either will work. I think it's a preference. I've done both before. I just like the stretch and folds. So this part is where it's going to develop the gluten, the strengthening in your bread. So these are very, very important. Now, how many you do, I think is a learning experience really, because once you get to know kind of what the dough is supposed to look like and how it's supposed to feel when your stretch and folds are done, will determine how long you have to do them. But in most cases, I do four, 30 minutes apart. So it sat on the counter for 30 minutes. I'm about to do my first stretch and fold. 30 minutes later, I'll do a second, third, and fourth. Now, if I feel like on my third one, it the dough looks like it's where it needs to be, that I won't do anymore. But it all comes from experience with that. So, okay, so let's get started. Did I finish my thought? From experience. So for right now, just do four, uh, stretch and folds every 30 minutes. 
All right, here we go. Little tidbit. Put some water on your hands. And you're gonna kinda wanna fold your hand underneath it and you're gonna lift it up, make sure it doesn't tear. And you're gonna wanna let it sit back down. Same on this side. It is going to be sticky right now because everything has not come together yet. But over the next couple, two or three stretch and folds, you'll see it'll be less sticky and easier to work with. This feels pretty good actually right now. Kind of give it a little jiggle. You just don't want it to tear. I can't remember if I did three. We're gonna do one more though. Okay. Back on the counter it goes for 30 minutes. Technology. I did my second set of stretch and folds only to look up to see my camera saying it was repairing my file. So I don't even think, I don't know what it recorded and what it didn't. So I did my second set of stretch and folds. Um, it's still kind of sticky. I probably should have wetted my hand more, but anyways, leave it on the counter. We're gonna do this again in another 30 minutes. Okay, sorry about the AC running. It's a little warm in here. I just did my final set of stretch and folds. I didn't record it. It was the same as the other two. Now comes the part that is probably the trickiest to get down, and I still don't have it down perfectly. Um, it is the bulk fermenting stage. And technically the bulk fermenting stage is as soon as the water and flour and salt are mixed, that's when it starts. But um, this is what they call the bulk fermenting stage. And this is the first rise of your dough. How long it goes, it depends on your environment. Some recipes will tell you bulk ferment on the counter for 10 to 12 hours bulk ferment on the counter for four to six. Well, that's really hard because your environment may not be the same as mine. Um, in the north, they're probably still having winter temps. Their outside temperatures are in the 50s or inside temperatures are maybe in their 60s. Right now it's 80 degrees outside at my house. It's 75 in my house. So my dough naturally is going to rise in faster than those up north. So you have to be really careful with those recipes. Um, just because your environment's different. Now, it's tricky, it's hard, I still do not get it. What you want to look for is your dough, and this is where I told you I wanted a glass bowl. See all these little air holes and pockets and stuff like that? You're gonna wait and make sure those, you know, continue to increase in size, and you want your dough to in double in size. The problem with that is you want it to double in size, but not to 100%. You want it to double in size, but not to 100%. 75 to 80% is a good range because um, if you're going to put it in your refrigerator, and we'll get to that in a little bit um, after it bulk ferments, it's gonna continue to rise. So at that point, if you are at 100% rise on the counter and then you put it in the refrigerator and it continues to rise, then you could overproof it. I also wanted to show this. So this is where when we first started and that's how much she's risen. And I didn't feed her anything. I just kind of stirred her up and it reincorporated some flour that maybe wasn't incorporated very well and so she's risen a little bit more. I'm gonna let her finish rising and then when she falls, I'll put her back in the refrigerator. But it's pretty warm today and so all this moisture, I don't want her out on the counter too long because I don't want her again to develop mold or anything. But Anyways, all right, see y'all in a little bit. So this is why sometimes you have to just watch the dough because I had said it was gonna take like five, five and a half hours and it's been um, three hours and this is what it looks like. It's not sticky, it's domed really nice. She jiggles when you wiggle her. So this is ready. Um, she's gonna go, I'm gonna shape her and then I'm gonna put her in the refrigerator. She's probably gonna be a little bit overproofed at that point because she's more than doubled, but um, it went really fast. So I wasn't expecting that to do it. So it just goes to show your temperature of your house, the humidity, the heat, all of that plays a factor in how fast this goes. Um, so let me shape it. I'll show you what I do when I shape it. And then I'm gonna put it in the banneton. I floured it really, really well. 
That way it um, doesn't stick to it when I put it in the refrigerator. So let's shape it real quick. Okay, so I always lightly flour my surface. Some people say you shouldn't, but I do. And then I'm going to dump her. Some say you can help them out. Some say you shouldn't help them out. Some say just kind of give her a wiggle back and forth, let her release from the bowl on its own. And see, she's releasing all around. I'm not going to help because it's staying forever. I'm going to say, it's just not out of the bowl. The bowl should be clean. I've never been able to get a dough out of a bowl without eating some residual. Like, I just pick it out, pop it on there, and then I just kind of give it a good coating of the flour. It's just easier to work with. Um, it shouldn't be super sticky at this point. It should be somewhat manageable and then you're gonna laminate it this is just stretching the dough out this dough feels really really nice the other way you they say you can tell is if you do a window pane test if you can stretch your dough and it goes clear and it doesn't break I guess but whatever okay So then I just fold mine over this way, and I fold it over this way, and then I roll it up. This is the part. So then, this is where you do a tuck. This is what builds tension in your loaf. So you just, I saw a video where you do like a candy cane, you push and pull towards you gently. You don't want to tear the dough. And how many times you do this, I can't tell you. It's just whatever you feel like the dough is, has some structure to it. And you take this and you put your dough upside down. And then a lot of people stitch it. Mine never stays, but I still try to do it though. I don't know what this does, guys, this part. No clue. I'm gonna stitch it. And it's gonna look like that. And then I'm gonna put it in the refrigerator. It's gonna sit in the refrigerator overnight it's seven o'clock right now and I'll probably bake it about seven or eight in the morning. I'll pull it out and show you guys how I score it and things like that. But for now, I'm just going to go ahead and put it in the refrigerator, let it finish doing its thing. Okay, so it's the next morning. It's actually like the afternoon. But so I took the dough out of the refrigerator and you can see it's still it almost did another probably 25% rise. I don't know if you guys can see it or not. So um, <clears throat> so now we're going to bake it. I've actually already been preheating my oven with my cast iron Dutch oven inside of it. It's at 375. Now, there's a lot of ways and uh, techniques and methods and all that kind of stuff that are out there that how you preheat a Dutch oven. So... I will tell you, I think it really is all about preference. I'm sure there is logic behind a lot of the things that you do and why they do them a certain way. But for me, um, I used to preheat my oven for with the Dutch oven for like an hour. But now I'm just 30, 45 minutes. Like I don't have time to be waiting an hour for my Dutch oven to preheat. So it is a cast iron. I had an enamel one. Um, you can use an enamel like Dutch oven, except you have to make sure it's rated for high temperatures. So this is what I do. Preheated my Dutch oven with the lid on. It's been in there for probably about 35, 40 minutes. I'm going to put it on, I bought these on Amazon. It's a two pack, they were like $7.99. These are the um, silicone sleeves, um, sling. 
we're going to put it on it and we're going to score it. Now, sometimes I get fancy with my scoring, sometimes I just score it. It doesn't even matter. So that's what I'm going to do right now. And then we're going to put it in our Dutch oven and then we're going to bake it. I haven't found like the sweet spot for baking yet time-wise. So um, what I'm going to try to do today, it's at 475. I'm going to bake it with the lint on. I'm gonna drop the temperature down to 450. I'm gonna bake it for, with the lid on for about 35 minutes and then I'm gonna drop the temperature down to 425 and then I'm gonna bake it for about another 10 and we're gonna see, we're gonna kinda see what that looks like. I don't know, we'll see. Um, but I do use the thermometer because you, if you can get your bread between 206 and 210, that's what's considered baked and that's gonna prevent it from over, under baking and even over baking. So let's get this thing scored. Okay, this is my score. I got it on Amazon also. Nothing fancy. Like I told you guys, the first time I baked bread, I um, used a knife for it. So, all right. So, that's how I do it. I just plop it out. She is looking good. Nice and round. Let's move this out of the way. And then we're just going to do, I'm going to do two scores. These are, ex you're going to want to do an expansion score because um, the bread will explode. So you've got to give it away for all the air to release it. So I usually just go over it twice, my expansion scores. And you can do fun little designs if you want, but there's no reason for that today. So, all right, now the fun part is getting this really, really hot cast iron out of the oven. All right, so yes, my Dutch oven is piping, piping hot right now, and I probably shouldn't have the lid out this long. So I just set it in here. I also do two ice cubes. It creates steam. Some people said you don't have to do that. I do it. I like it. I've done it from the beginning. I'm just going to keep doing it. I shouldn't have had the lid off that wall. Be careful. You will burn yourself. Drop the temperature down to 450. And then we're going to let this bake for about 35 minutes and we'll see what it looks like. So a couple things, you don't need those slings. Parchment paper will work just fine, not wax paper, parchment paper. Um, just make sure it's, um, what's it, what's the word I'm trying to say? Regulated, I guess, for high temperatures. Apparently some of the parchment papers, the higher the temperature, they can't, they're not made for that high of temp. So make sure you read that. I didn't know that was a thing until I started baking sourdough. Um, but anyways, I used to just use uh, parchment paper. And I actually like it better than the sling, but I don't know. I didn't, I actually don't think I have any parchment paper. So the slings worked. Um, to make sure it doesn't burn on the bottom, that's a big thing. I burnt my first one the very first time I ever baked it. It wasn't bad, but it was enough. It was edible, but it was enough that I was like, what? How do you fix that? There's a ton of ways out there also, but all I do is I put a cookie sheet underneath the um, Dutch oven in the oven just to help disperse that heat where it's not coming straight up into the Dutch oven. So that's all I do. All right, so we're gonna cook it for 35 minutes at 450. We're gonna drop the temp down to 425, take the lid off, and um, we'll bake it for another 10, 15-ish minutes. Um, I've over baked them the last couple times. It's been my fault. I think I've baked them too long with the lid off and I don't want that. So I'm really gonna watch it this time and we'll kind of see where our timing is. So, all right, I'll see you on 35 minutes. That's the most exciting part, is taking your lid off to see if you've got a good oven spring, meaning that it rose in the Dutch oven. Um, if you got a good oven spring, that means your starter is strong, you did all your stretch and folds right, all of those things. And then um, the next thing is cutting into it to see what it looks like. So. All right, it's been about, well, it's been 35 minutes and I'm gonna go ahead and close this back. So I took the lid off and I'm gonna drop the temperature down. 
to 425 and I'm gonna bake it for 10 minutes and I'm gonna see what it looks like okay so it's out of the oven it's registering at 210 which is perfect so I'm going to take it out of the Dutch oven and I'm gonna set it over here on the um, cooling rack and you have to let it cool guys you have to um, if you cut into it too soon, then the bread is still cooking right now. It'll finish cooking. So at a minimum an hour, sometimes two. I've checked the temperature of the bread before at like the four hour mark and it's still like 87 degrees internally. So let it do its thing. Try to resist the urge to cut through it and then um, let it finish cooking. So I'm going to set it over there for several hours. We'll come back once I cut it open and we'll see what we got. All right, it's been probably about three, three and a half hours. We're gonna go ahead and cut into it. Let's see what it looks like. Always have a good bread knife too. Okay. All right, let's see what she looks like. Oh, she looks good. It's not doughy. Super fluffy. Okay, so there you have it. There's my sourdough bread um, recipe, start to finish. And pretty simple, foolproof. Um, yeah, so if you guys have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. Again, I'm not a professional. Um, there's probably a lot of uh, professional bakers out there that cook sourdough that could totally critique and tear apart my method. And that's fine because it doesn't matter to me because I am not selling these in a bakery. I don't sell them. I give them to my son starting his four-wheeler or his um, dirt bike. I don't give them to anyone and my family loves it. And overall, it's going to get eaten one way or the other. So thank you guys for watching. I'll try to keep doing a few more of these videos on sourdough. Um, some other little recipes that I've tried before. And then stay tuned because I'm also going to show you guys how I feed my starter. So uh, make sure you subscribe. Leave any questions you have down below. We'll see you again. Bye.